Hello, and welcome to Agrosive Physics. Today is day 47, where we're going to discuss the different types of friction and surface area and how it affects friction. Well, we've already discussed kinetic and static friction. Kinetic is friction that is moving, and static is friction that is stationary. But we have other types of friction that you may deal with in more advanced physics courses. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention some of them now. Rolling friction is a friction that exists between the surface and the point of contact between a wheel. As an object moves, you know that the wheel allows something to move easier than if you slide it or drag it across the floor. One of the main reasons is because you have traction between the wheel and the ground. But if you think about it, only the point touching the ground, which is a single spot, will be in contact with the ground. And it will cause the static friction to actually produce the traction needed in order for an object to move. So rolling friction actually involves static friction that is constantly staying um, within the limit. If you have the object slip, all of a sudden you have kinetic friction and the object won't or the wheel won't actually turn. Well, it'll turn, but it won't cause the, the vehicle to move forward. But a circle is touching the ground at a single point. Now, of course, because of the weight of the vehicle, it's not a single point because the tire pushes down um, and the width of the tire is going to matter as well. In fact, in drag races, they'll use heat um, to burn the tires and the tires are actually, they're not studded, they're, they're flat. And that heat will actually cause the traction to increase between um, the, the track and the tire itself. So we're using a very simplified version of friction for now for an introductory physics course. But as you take more advanced courses, you learn more about rolling friction and the, the varied uh, ways that you can calculate um, friction of wheels. Now, in addition to rolling friction, fluid friction is another example of friction. And we've been dealing with that when we talked about air resistance or drag. Fluid of air or water um, will push back on objects as they're moving through them. The viscosity of the material matters. If you're trying to um, travel through regular water, that would be a certain amount of viscosity, which is a fancy word for the friction of the fluid itself. But the object moving through the fluid would have drag on it as well. Now, different types of materials, seawater versus freshwater, will have different types of fluid friction. Now, air is also a fluid, and that will have drag. We call that wind resistance or drag and that would oppose the motion as well. The problem with fluid friction is that it changes based on the speed. So it's not something that stays constant. And that's why we stick to kinetic and static friction of sliding friction, because that's gonna be easier to deal with. If you have fluid friction and you take more advanced courses and you deal with wind resistance, you're gonna be dealing with a varied frictional force that opposes the motion. So basically, as an object moves faster, the friction increases until, of course, you reach a limit where the friction cannot get any bigger and you'll reach a terminal speed for whatever the object is, especially if an object's in free fall. So rolling and fluid friction are other types of friction, and, of course, there's more, um, but you would, you would look at those as you take more advanced physics courses. Now, another topic I want to discuss today is surface area and how that affects the amount of friction. And what we def define surface area is, as is the amount of contact between the surface and the object that is moving on the surface. And if we take a block and drag it across the, the, the ground, we are going to actually have the same amount of friction as if we cut the block in half and then have both blocks glued together sideways and then drag that across the ground, effectively increasing the surface contact, but um, decreasing the overall mass above each point. Now, of course, we simplify the force of gravity on an object, and we treat it as acting at the center of gravity or the center of mass of the object. And most objects we deal with are rectangular, and we try to keep them a uniform um, shape. However, in the real world, we have objects that are varied in terms of their shape, and sometimes the weight is not distributed evenly throughout the object. For our purposes, though, we consider the surface area to be irrelevant in terms of friction. So if we took um, an entire book and spread out every page of the book, and of course if it didn't have a cover, um, that would have the same amount of friction as uh, the whole book together. And that's basically because we're taking more contact between the surface and the book 
However, we're decreasing the force above each point of contact. And remember, when two objects are rubbing against one another, they're not completely touching one another. It's only the microscopic points that are in contact between each point, and that will vary as it moves. What's important is that since we simplify the force of gravity as the center of mass and we use our equation mu fn, the normal force hasn't changed even if we spread out the object on the, on the surface. So for our purposes, we treat the surface area as um, irrelevant in terms of calculating the friction, and that's mainly because the normal force stays the same. If you want to think about it this way, if you take a book and you place it on, uh, on its cover and you slide it, it has a certain amount of friction. If you pay, put it on the spine, well, you have the same surface, probably the cover is made of the same material, but you have less points of contact. Although all the microscopic points aren't touching at any given moment, what you have is more um, of the mass is above each point. So if you have it flat on its back, it will be uh, more points of contact, but less mass above each point. If you put it on its spine, it's less points of contact, but more mass at each point. But basically, in order to find the normal force, we just take the total mass anyway, multiply it by 9.8, and that would be the normal force. And if you put the book and any orientation on the table, the normal force stays the same. It's the same book. So when we're dealing with sliding friction, the normal force is going to matter when we deal with the total friction that we calculate. And since surface area of the book on its spine versus its cover, front or back, is going to be the same value for the normal force, we're going to consider the friction to be the same throughout. Um, of course, if you have, you know, I was talking about a paper example, you take all the pages out, that's going to increase wind resistance as well. So that's going to change the, the values also. But for our purposes, we, consi we consider um, wind resistance to be negligible in the problems, and we're able to ca calculate the problems based on um, the normal force and the surface contact themselves, so the coefficient of friction. When we're dealing with friction problems in an introductory physics course, we typically try to start simply, and then as you become more uh, competent in your physics knowledge, you'll be able to use more higher level mathematics as well and calculate for more realistic problems. But for everyday problems in a laboratory setting, um, we're able to simulate physics quite well just using sliding friction. So for our purposes, we have different types of friction, static and kinetic or, or what we're going to deal with, and the surface area does not affect the total friction. The total friction is going to be constant whether or not we place a book on its cover, front or back, or we place it on its spine and then slide it. Friction will be the same throughout. And that concludes our discussion of the different types of friction and whether or not surface area matters. And surface area does not affect the total friction. Friction is constant regardless of the surface area of the object that is um, touching the surface. Thank you. Now one would think if I have a object like this, let's say like, like a book, and I place it on its cover versus placing it on its spine we would have more friction when it's laying flat and less friction when it's vertical like this. That's not true. The reality is friction is the same for each. So what does that tell me about surface area? Surface area does not matter. Now here's why does not matter. Let me write that out. Basically, when we find the force of gravity on an object, we treat all the mass as being centrally located and gravity is pulling on the book in this case all at that single point. We simplify it so that we can consider the motion um, at a single point as it's a projectile or as it's translating sideways through the through the or on the ground or, or even vertically through the air. The reality is objects are not always distributed evenly in terms of their mass. But for our purposes, if we're finding the force of gravity, well, that's going to be equal and opposite to the normal force in this case. Right here, force of gravity acts at the center. That will be equal and opposite to the normal force. 
And if we're looking at our equation, mu fn, well, the surface is cover versus table, and this is still cover versus table. So mu is the same for both problems, and fn is the same for both problems. Now, for many students, that still doesn't sit well, so they want a, a better understanding of that. And here's the, the best I can give for this um, that kind of combines the fictitious center of mass that we're considering all the, you know, all the mass to be centrally located versus the reality. Now, if we have the book on its cover, we're actually spreading out the mass over the entire book. So if these arrows represent the mass at each point, we have an even distribution, um, but you know, and I just drew uh, three, six, seven different arrows. But then that would mean we have seven spots where the book is pushing down on the ground. That would be seven amounts of friction, if you will. Um, now remember, since the table, this is the table here, is bumpy, and of course the book is too, not every spot is actually in contact with the table or the book at any given moment. But since the weight is distributed outward along the book's surface, um, we're getting a little bit of weight, or a little bit of mass in this case, over each spot. So that would be a little bit of Fn. And then the mu's being the same, we'd get a little bit of friction, we add it all up, and we get a value. You know, and this is if we did this um, painstakingly over different spots and we had to worry about weight distribution. Now, on the other hand, if we were to do it this way, what we effectively have are maybe one or two huge arrows pushing down. All the weight is at these single spots. And we'd only calculate two amounts of friction. Friction is mu Fn. Well, this is a big Fn. And mu is the same. That doesn't change. But now we only have two of them, let's say. So all that weight above the spots, and remember, not every point is in contact because it's bumpy. What we'd end up having is the same value for F, if we had the two frictions that we calculated versus the seven little frictions, they all add up to the same amount. So either we have our weight distributed uh, across the entire um, book, if it's on its cover, or we have most of the weight distributed over a, a few spots. This explanation seems to work a little better. This is not entirely how it works, um, but I think it makes a little more sense than just saying all the mass is, is you know, concentrated at one spot. It really isn't. Um, so if the weight's distributed, it's a little bit of friction over that distribution. And if it's vertical like this, it's a lot of friction over a few spots. So either one of these equates to the same amount of total friction. So total friction is constant. Now, of course, introductory physics we oversimplify as much as possible so that you can understand the concept and if this is something that you really uh, feel slighted because you're not learning the real aspect of friction well take some uh, more advanced courses as you continue and you'll learn how complex friction can be um, and there's a lot to do with friction that uh, we're not going to cover in this course but hopefully this is sparking your interest in, uh, in friction, and maybe you continue that study in, in your future endeavors. But for our purposes, surface area does not matter. Friction is the same no matter what.